China's rise has a dark side. That dark side exploded on February 6, 2012, when the political intrigues of one of the Communist Party's top leaders, Bo Xilai, spilled into public view. On that fateful day, Wang Lijun, Chongqing's police chief, and Bo's longtime henchman fled to the U.S. consulate in Chengdu, pleading for asylum. Before a group of startled American diplomats, he frantically explained that he possessed incriminating evidence about Bo's abuse of power and his wife's murder of a British fixer. Soon after, Bo was taken away by national security authorities to Beijing. In the subsequent months, rumors soared about a coup instigated by Bo and his allies. The next new leader, Xi Jinping, took power amid perilous circumstances. No wonder when he delivered his first speech to the Politburo, his first order of business was fighting corruption. He did not mince words. Corruption, he declared, will doom the party and the nation. According to conventional wisdom, corrupt countries are usually poor, whereas Western superpowers like the US and the UK, most people believe prospered because they established clean, good governance. Clearly, China has a serious corruption problem. If so, why has it sustained 40 years of economic growth? The story of Mr. Fu provides some clues to the puzzle. Mr. Fu is one of the richest men of his generation. Lavishing bribes and company shares, Upon powerful officials, he received in exchange subsidies, cheap loans, and land grants for his railway projects. These railways catapulted national growth by enabling travel and spurring commerce across the country. But they also contained the seeds of a crisis. Corrupt politicians indulged companies like Mr. Fools to inflate their costs and accumulate debts. When one of these companies went bankrupt, others followed. Banks panicked, prices fell, and the stock market plunged. The coal and iron industries suffered, along with the railroads. Sounds familiar? This came to be known in America as the Panic of 1873. Mr. Fu is not Chinese. He's American. His full name, Sitan Fu, is the Chinese translation for Mr. Leyland Stanford who gave away his wealth to a famous university named after him, which is coincidentally where I received my PhD education. Mr. Stanford was the man behind the Transcontinental Railroad. He played a monumental role in America's modernization, but his path to immense fortune was also paved with deal-making corruption and was linked to financial crisis. Normally, we think of China and the U.S. as two cultural opposites with nothing in common. People invoke the term, the clash of civilizations. In reality, if you take stories from America's Gilded Age in the 19th century and replace them with Chinese names, you think that I'm describing contemporary China. Both experience a period of rapid growth and urbanization, along with risk, inequality, and corruption. It was the best of times, but also the worst of times. Since market opening in 1978, China has been undergoing its own Gilded Age, similar but not identical to the American version. A comparative historical perspective helps us explain the opening puzzle. If China is so corrupt, why has it sustained an economic boom? China only appears to be an outlier because conventional wisdom paints the myth that Western democracies prospered through clean, good governance and have no corruption. Conventional wisdom, as seen in global corruption metrics, also fail to distinguish among types of corruption. And in particular, they overlook what I call the corruption of the rich. Like in America's Gilded Age, China's political economy came to be dominated by a particular type of corruption, access money, elite exchanges, 
of power and wealth. Access money functions as the steroids of capitalism. It rewards politicians for promoting growth and helping connected capitalists to build, borrow, and invest, all of which contributes to GDP growth. But it also produces systemic risk and inequality. Yet even as access money exploded, the Chinese central government gradually controlled growth-damaging types of corruption, such as embezzlement. In other words, the quality of corruption in China is different from typical predatory states that only steal but do not deliver. That is why we observe a similar outcome in both the American and Chinese Gilded Ages. Speedy, but also risky and imbalanced growth. In the rest of the episode, let me elaborate on this argument in a few parts. Let's begin by unbundling corruption. Normally, we think of corruption as a one-dimensional problem, rated from zero to 100. This is the approach taken by influential global indices, such as the Corruption Perception Index, CPI, which is widely cited by the media and even in scholarly studies. In this approach, rich countries are consistently rated as clean, while poor countries are rated as very corrupt. In 2017, for example, China was ranked more corrupt than Jamaica and Rwanda. However, corruption comes in qualitatively different types that cannot be reduced into a single score. To unbundle corruption, I offer a simple four-part typology divided along two dimensions. The first dimension is whether the corruption involves elites or non-elites, for example, the president and his family, or street-level police officers. The second dimension is whether the corruption involves exchange or theft. The intersection of the two dimensions creates four categories of corruption. One, petty theft. Two, grand theft. Three, speed money petty bribes paid to low-level officials to overcome a delay or to get a license faster, and for access money, not the same as speed money. Access money are lavish perks paid to powerful officials, not just for speed, but for exclusive, lucrative access. For example, cheap land, government contracts, lax regulations, tax breaks. Unlike speed money, access money can be legal and institutionalized. But in developing countries like China, such corruption is still illegal and personal, manifesting in the form of massive bribes. Here's another way to understand their distinction. Speed money are bribes derived from blocking businesses whereas access money are rewards collecting by helping selected businesses make enormous profits that they otherwise could not without the government's help. Like drugs, different types of corruption harm in different ways. Petty theft and grand theft are equivalent to toxic drugs. They're the most damaging as they drain public and private wealth. Speed money is not as bad as petty and grand theft, but it does not spur growth. Think of it as painkillers. It lessens headaches, but it does not help you grow muscles. Access money, on the other hand, are the steroids of capitalism. Steroids are known as growth-enhancing drugs, but such drugs come with serious side effects over time, historically we have seen the side effects of access money play out in settings around the world. Crony capitalism and state capture contributed to financial crashes in 19th century America, of which there were five, the Asian financial crisis in 1997, and most recently, the 2008 US financial crisis. In 2023, that bubble is bursting in China as well. Understanding the deal-making corruption embedded in China's growth model 
helps us appreciate both its stupendous rise and the problems that have come with it. Now that we have a typology, we can think about corruption comparatively as well as how it evolved over time. Global metrics like the CPI have done a great public service by bringing attention to the problem of corruption. The create a cross-national perception measure of corruption takes a lot of work and time. Having tried making one myself, I know how hard it is. But the CPI's concept and measurement of corruption is problematic and even misleading. First of all, the CPI is a perception-based measure based on experts. But this survey is not done in-house. Rather, it is aggregated from existing third-party sources, which means that the CPI has no control over their methods and changes in scores may not reflect reality at all. It gives a single corruption score to each country and does not distinguish among different types of corruption. This is like sausage making. Different meats are mushed into one sausage. Third is an issue that existing critiques have not pointed out. The design and wording of the surveys it uses can be quite problematic. For instance, the World Competitiveness Yearbook, one of CPI's sources, asked senior business leaders a single terse question. Bribery and corruption exist or do not exist? Another example is from EIU's country risk ratings. Are there general abuses of public resources? Imagine if you were asked to answer this question for the UK, China, or Kenya. Could you give an accurate answer? For starters, people define corruption differently, so the way the questions are asked poses a serious validity problem. To correct some of these problems, I created my own index, the Unbundled Corruption Index, UCI. Instead of giving a bundled score, I asked country experts to rate the prevalence of the four categories of corruption in my framework. These experts include area specialists, journalists, senior business executives who know a particular country well. Instead of asking experts to rate corruption using one blanket question, I pose a series of stylized vignettes. One example, inspired by the saga of the Chinese politician Bo Xilai, one question captures access money in this way. By cultivating close ties with a powerful official and paying for his family's expenses, a business person gains monopoly access to public construction projects. How common do you think this type of scenario is in the country you are rating today? The advantage of using a vignette is that it ensures that the expert raters are thinking about a similar scenario rather than imagining different concepts in their head. At the same time, I try to pick vignettes that represent a broader set of cases. Another example is inspired by a New York Times report about the practice of revolving doors in the U.S. And it reads, Major figures move back and forth between the public and private sector, and there are no laws forbidding this practice. How common do you think this type of scenario is in the country you're rating today? Then I aggregate the results by category and visualize them in this format. The total UCI score is indicated at the top left in brackets. On top of that, you can also see the composition of corruption distributed over the four categories. As you can see, China has all types of corruption, but the most dominant type of corruption is access money. My pilot includes 15 countries, including India, Nigeria, the US and South Korea. It allows us to compare not only the overall levels of corruption, but also its composition and dominant type. Here I zoom in on a paired comparison of China and India, which is especially interesting. Although the two countries have nearly identical total scores, their patterns of corruption diverge. In India, the most dominant type of corruption is speed money. 
paying bribes to overcome delays. Whereas in China, access money, elite exchanges of power and wealth prevails. Why is that? This quote from a high-level official in New Delhi is revealing. He says, If you want me to move a file faster, I'm not sure if I can help you. But if you want me to stop a file, I can do that immediately. His quote implies that regime type matters. Because India is a fragmented democracy, officials have the power to veto, but not to make unilateral decisions. So bribes tend to be paid to overcome the numerous hurdles created by the bureaucracy. In China, it is the opposite. Power is concentrated. Bribes are paid to open doors and waive restrictions. Put differently, in India, bribes are imposed to prevent things from being built, whereas in China, bribes are collected to get things built. Next, China and USA. Another interesting comparison. As you can see, overall, the U.S. has less corruption than China. But in both, access money is the dominant type of corruption. Then there is a deeper nuance. Whereas access money in the U.S. today is primarily institutional, in China it is enmeshed within personal relationships and still involves bribes and illegal actions. As American legal scholar Lawrence Lexick acknowledges, the notion that our Congress is corrupt as an institution, while none of the members of Congress is corrupt individually, is hard for many to accept. If you're interested to hear more on, is the US really less corrupt than China? Question mark. Catch my interview with Stephen Dobner on Freakonomics. China did not arrive at its current structure of corruption in one day. There was a long process of evolution. When China first opened its economy, it was plagued by forms of corruption found in poor developing countries. Petty bribery, bureaucratic extortion, embezzlement, misuse of public funds. One famous victim was McDonald's in Beijing, which in the 1990s was forced to pay 31 fees to local agencies, most of them illegal. Such petty extractive corruption posed a heavy burden on businesses and farmers alike. But entering into the 2000s, the situation began to change drastically. Data on prosecuted corruption cases from 1998 to 2014 provides some insights into this evolutionary process. Corruption with exchange measures bribery. Corruption with theft includes embezzlement and misuse of public funds. As you can see in 1998, there were many more cases of corruption with theft than with exchange. Back then, embezzlement and misuse of public funds were rampant because monitoring capacities were very weak. But by 2014, the patterns were reversed. Corruption with theft came sharply under control, while bribery exploded. Not only that, since 1998, bribery has involved ever larger sums of money and more senior officials. One example is Liu Zhijun, a former minister of railways. He was charged for taking 65 million yuan in bribes, not including 350 appointments one for each day of the year. What explains these structural changes? The first factor is administrative reforms. In 1993, after Deng Xiaoping put the country firmly back on the path of capitalism and retired, a new leadership under Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji took over. Their mission was to build institutions fit for a modern market economy. To this end, they rolled out comprehensive administrative reforms, which quietly increased the state's ability to control growth-damaging forms of corruption. Simultaneously, the Chinese growth model shifted from manufacturing toward construction, debt, and real estate. 
Because the central government drastically re-centralized tax revenue in 1994, it allowed local governments to generate revenue by leasing land to businesses. Jean Oi and her colleagues has extensively studied this history, and they call it a grand bargain. By leasing land and using land to borrow from banks, local governments launched an infrastructure boom. What are some of the risks and imbalances in China's boom? Number one, one well-known risk is excessive investment and speculative bubbles in real estate. Because governments control land, this is a sector where power is easily monetized and it offers astronomical rents. Two, this is accompanied by mounting corporate and government debt. In 2010, local government debt as a share of tax revenue was 200%. It increased every year. By 2019, that number was close to 300%. Three, because construction and real estate offer such attractive gains, especially for those with political connections, this has resulted in perverse incentives among private entrepreneurs who are inclined to abandon the real economy for speculative profit. This issue became serious enough that the state council openly warned against it and called for private entrepreneurs to revive the quote-unquote real economy. Four, another outcome is rising inequality. In 2012, when Xi took office, China's Gini coefficient, a measure of income inequality, actually exceeded that of the United States. Such inequality results in a paradox that has touched the lives of every Chinese person. The poor find that they cannot afford housing, while the rich have too many homes but do not live in them. All of these side effects generate economic risk for China, but they're not reflected in GDP, which is only a crude measure of economic activities. They also generate political risk, Brazen cronyism and inequality undermines the legitimacy of a party that is communist in name. That corruption and capitalism has historically gone hand in hand is not a justification of corruption. I'm only making a factual observation. Let me be clear, all corruption is harmful, even if they encourage deals in the short term. If there is a moral message, it is to expose the partial myths about Western development that underpin conventional theories in political economy. Once we recognize the real fraught histories of Western capitalism, rather than fairy tales told about it, we'll see that China is only as exceptional as the West.